Hey guys, Greg Benz here. Today I want to talk to you about my absolute favorite piece of kit for getting better photographs out of Photoshop, and that's by using a Wacom tablet and pen. I'm going to cover three things in this video. Firstly, what's so great about Wacom tablets for photographers? Secondly, which of the many options out there should you actually buy? And then thirdly, if you have one or once you get it, what's the best way to set it up and configure it for optimal results? So starting with that first question about why a Wacom tablet? Think about the way that we interact with our computers as photographers. We go in and we make these small but precise adjustments in Photoshop. Perhaps we're using the healing brush to remove something or dodging and burning some little piece of the image. Or on this channel, many times you've probably seen me paint through a luminosity selection onto a layer mask or just generally paint on a layer mask. All of this brush-like activity with your computer these small, precise, repetitive adjustments, they don't work very well with a trackpad or mouse. And they are very much like using a brush. So if we think about the real world analogy, if I was a painter, not using a computer, I just have an old school canvas and a paintbrush, the way I would paint is I would take that brush and I'd hold it with three fingers and I'd use those fingers to manipulate the brush around the canvas. I might use a little bit of my shoulder and elbow, but basically my fingers are doing the really fine, precise work. If I take the analogy of a mouse, my fingers are only clicking. So what I'm doing is moving everything with my elbow and shoulder. Well, in the painting world, that would be like if I took this brush and I just clench my fist around it, and now I start painting on the canvas using only my elbow and shoulder. It wouldn't be very accurate. It would look ridiculous. And maybe it wouldn't get tiring, but it certainly wouldn't be my best work. Now with the trackpad, it would be a little bit like I took this brush and tossed it away and instead dipped my finger in the paint and then just started pushing my finger around that canvas. My finger would get sore. It wouldn't be very accurate. And again, I wouldn't be doing my best work, especially with the thousands of brush strokes I might have to do to complete that work of art. So that's what's so great about a Wacom tablet. It's not the different features and benefits you might read about. It has everything to do with just holding a pen in your hand. It's just the most natural way for a human to move a cursor on the screen. No one has invented a better technology. It's very natural. Even if you do it thousands of times over and over on an image for hours, you're going to get great results and you're not going to cause sore knuckles and other fatigue in your body. Now, so I've sort of, I think, paved the way for the discussion around which device should you get. I don't think all these features matter. So any of these devices are going to be great. It doesn't have to come from Wacom. It could be any vendor. It doesn't matter which features you get. You just need a pen. Now that said, Wacom is the market leader. They make great, reliable systems. So I use Wacom. It's the only devices I've ever used. So I think it's an excellent choice, but there are many options out there and you can save a few dollars if you go to some off-brand alternative tablet. Within them, I would say that, you know, the whether you have an eraser on the device or how many buttons are on it, I, I personally don't care. I don't really use the buttons hardly ever for any of this stuff. What I do think matters is the size. So this is the small Bluetooth model from Wacom. It's relatively new, $99 if you pay a full price for it. So pretty affordable device. This is really all you need. Being that it's Bluetooth, it doesn't need any wires. So it's great for travel. It's small, battery powered, rechargeable, lasts a very long time. So that's a great option. If you're working at a desktop, you could also use this device, or you might decide to use the medium one, you get a little bit larger working area, which may be a nice thing. You will pay two or three times as much for that device, but it may be worth considering. I personally use a medium device at home because I'm actually using this as a mouse pad, and I'll get to that in a moment. So I, I like that slightly larger surface area, but the small one is fine. They also make large devices, and I would skip that. Unless you're a digital illustrator, uh, as photographers, the large to me is just too big. There's no point spending the money. I think it's it's just unwieldy the size. So small is great for everyone. You might want to consider a medium and just don't worry about all the other features that are included with it. Just save the money. It's not that important. Now, I mentioned the mouse and that kind of brings me to the next topic, which is how to get the most out of a Wacom tablet. And the first thing is understanding its limitations. It's great for anything that is like using a brush for cloning, dodging, painting in a layer mask, all these sorts of things. But it's actually not very good for a lot of other things you would do with your computer. For example, if you just want to 
drag and drop files in the file explorer to move them around your computer or something like that outside of Photoshop, you're probably going to find that using a pen is a little awkward because you have to sort of tap and release as you're moving around to do these operations. And it's just too easy to make a mistake. If you lift your pen off when you're brushing, you just create a new brush stroke. It's no big deal. But if you're moving a file and you accidentally drop it in the wrong folder, that's kind of a problem. So the biggest complaint I hear about people trying out Wacom pens and tablets is that they don't replace everything they've been doing. And the solution that's very simple, just don't use this as the only input device. So what I do is I have this wireless mouse. This is a Logic uh, MX Anywhere 2 mouse. I love this thing. It's 60 bucks, full price. It's rechargeable. It'll last for about a month if you leave it on continuously. Very reliable Bluetooth mouse. And I just put it right on top of the pad I would use for the pen and move this mouse around. So when I need the pen, I pick up the pen and brush in Photoshop. And if I don't, then I pick up the mouse and I use that. So I use both devices where they are strongest. That's probably the number one tip with Wacom is it's a great device, but don't try and force fit it into everything you do on your computer. Just use it where it's helpful and then use a mouse or the trackpad for everything else. So if you're using a laptop, you don't need a, a mouse. Uh, I use this mouse at home mostly. So when I'm traveling with my laptop, I just use the trackpad. Um, beyond the idea of a mouse, there's some software options with Wacom you can configure. So as I've said, the buttons on all this kind of stuff, it really doesn't matter. But if you want to optimize what you've paid for, there are a few things that are worth looking at. So if we jump into the configuration here in Mac operating system, you'll have access to an interface that looks something like this. And I say like this, because if you have a different model, like the medium or the large, you may not have the exact same appearance here. This is supposed to look like the top edge of my tablet. It's kind of showing me the buttons and saying that I can program different features of the tablet buttons in the tablet section. I can go to the pen section. I can program the pen, etc. So on the tablet section here, I can take this first button and right now it's set to be the shift key. So if I hold on this first button, then it'll be like holding shift in my computer and you'll see this little pop-up dialogue as I'm holding it down. Instead, I could program it to be something else. I could set it to be, uh, well, showing the desktop of my computer. And I could take the second button and I could set that instead to be a specific keystroke to maybe invoke some shortcut in Photoshop. Or I could go to open another application like Lightroom and browse to set that. So a lot of different things you can do here for the tablet buttons. Personally, I don't bother with any of them. I find it more confusing than helpful to have these unlabeled buttons that do stuff. But if you're into keyboard shortcuts and that sort of thing, definitely check it out because there's a lot of capability here. Under the pen section though, this is the stuff that I do like to change. I've got one of them set to be a right click. I don't have to pick up the mouse or the keyboard to get a right click. I can do it right from the pen. The other one I have is set to precision mode. So you go in here to tablet, precision mode, and you can set this here. What this does, let's go to Photoshop. Normally if I brush with a quick stroke, I get all the way across the screen. If I click into precision mode, so I just click that button. Now I make the same brush stroke. It's much slower and smaller. So what it's doing is, instead of letting the left edge of the tablet be the left edge of the screen, it maps to the left edge of this white box. And the right edge of the tablet is the right edge of this box and same with the top and the bottom. So I can never get outside of this box in precision mode. And for a given amount of hand motion, I get a much smaller, more precise adjustment of the cursor on screen. So this is a great thing to do when you're working around edges or critical detail, or if maybe you have shaky hands and you wanna have a more steady brush stroke, a lot of things you can do and if you go into the settings here under precision mode, you can determine how big that box is. So if I said it's ultra fine, well, then I get this tiny little box. And if I set it to fine, then I get this much larger box. So you can determine just how dialed in it is. But I kind of like something like this. And I find that works pretty well for me, a little bit right of the middle default. And then lastly is this tip field. This is the last system setting to worry about. If it's set to firm, when I click here and hold, I'm getting this little pressure readout. So if I push a little bit, I get a little bit. If I push harder, I get more. If I push really hard, I get to the maximum. If I set the tip feel over to soft, then even just the tiniest, lightest touches of the pen are quickly getting up to maximum. So I personally think that if you set it over towards firm, it's easier to control because you won't get to maximum unless you push super hard. 
Let's take a look at what you can do with that though in Photoshop. So that's how you configure it. And we're done with these system settings. There's nothing else that I really bother with. Click over into Photoshop. Let's undo these. And you'd see this normal brush stroke at 100% hardness, opacity and flow, we get a stroke like this. But if we click on this, we will set pressure to be the brush size. So now if I push lightly, I get small diameter. If I push a little harder, the diameter gets bigger. If I push hard, it keeps growing. If I push really hard, I get to the max and I can keep varying it so I can set this to whatever size I might need it to be just by varying the pressure that I put on the pen. So that's a pretty cool little feature. Let's turn that off. We can do the same thing with opacity over here. So now if I push a little bit, I get kind of light opacity. Even though I'm at 100% opacity and flow, the pressure is overriding that and it's limiting the opacity to be a small amount. So I can push a little bit, push a little harder, push really hard and adjust that flow. So I do like this, um, not the flow, the opacity setting here, I find really valuable. This one here, this airbrush effect, actually you might think it's gonna adjust the flow. It's actually the airbrush setting. So if we set the flow all the way down here and turn this on, what happens is with the airbrush on, even if I don't move my brush, it just keeps painting more and more in the same place. So it's not the same as adjusting the flow. It's, it's truly the airbrush. And you can see all of these by opening up the brush settings. So you can see it build up here is toggled because we have the airbrush on. So it, the airbrush is what is known as build up when I toggle this. And the opacity is under transfer. We see the control is set to pen pressure for opacity. So this is where I would change opacity in this brush dialog. If I wanted to control flow, I can go into transfer here instead and change the flow control to be pen pressure. And now if I push lightly, I get less flow and push harder, I get more flow. And so that's how I can control my flow with the pen pressure here. There's no direct icon for controlling the uh, pen to be flow in the toolbar. And then if I go to the size one, you see shape dynamics is where the size control is here. So toggling this is turning on and off the control for the size and how that's going to map. Let's turn our flow back up, it's easier to see. So you see that adjustment here. You also have the ability in this dialog to change the minimum diameter. So you don't have that control up here, but if you go into this minimum diameter, we could, for example, set the minimum diameter to be 50%. And what that means is, no matter how lightly I push on this pen, I can never get less than half of the expected diameter. So it's 150, so I can never get less than a 75 pixel, no matter how light I push. I can get bigger by pushing harder, but I can't get any smaller. Whereas if I take that diameter way down, then I can get to smaller amounts all the way until I'm basically down to this thin, tiny little thing. So if you find that you're getting too little adjustment when you're pushing light, you might wanna adjust this minimum, but I think you can generally kind of leave it alone. And overall, I think for most people, just toggle the size here, toggle the opacity here, and that's really probably all you'd ever need to do. And you can of course do both. So I can push light and get a little thin wispy and then push hard and get this much thicker thing. So I can do both at the same time if I want to. So you can get pretty advanced layering multiple different levels of pen control in here if you want. But personally, I mostly just use it for the opacity control. I find that works really well for painting. And that's everything I do with the Wacom. I, combine it with a mouse, I adjust the pressure and the buttons on the pen, and that's pretty much it. And with that, I have a much more natural way of controlling Photoshop for all this brush activity that I find takes my photography to an entirely different level. Hope you enjoyed that, guys. Be sure to click subscribe and ring the bell to get notified when I release the next video.